All right, Jeff, as promised, this is the longer version of uh, the construction video for your Battle Grade Lambda Chi Alpha Shield. It's essentially the exact same video as before, except uh, there'll be plenty of portions that are slowed down. There'll be much more exposition throughout the entirety of it, explaining why I'm doing certain things certain ways, why they were done that way historically, and just explaining all the grand, wonderful nerdisms about how this stuff was built, how this was constructed, and why. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. One of the first things I need to do is uh, process this brand new linen that I bought from the store. I need to run it through a hot, uh, extremely hot cycle through the wash to get off the post-processing chemicals that are uh, part of this fabric's manufacturing process. That way I can deal with it properly um, and, make, and turn it into a shield in the proper manner. But before I do that, we need to go back upstairs and get out the sewing machine. I need to go around the entire edge of all my fabric um, and just sew, you know, have one stitch line all the way around the edge. Uh, this just keeps the edge from fraying while it's in the wash, because otherwise it will do that and I will lose material. Uh, but while I'm giving you a time lapse, I will also explain to you some of the uh, historical uh, construction components and methods uh, behind the battle grade shield. So, without further uh, exposition, let's jump into it. So, many people and movies and television are, you know, to blame a lot for helping with this. A lot of people believe that shields in the Middle Ages, the medieval period, were largely made of metal. This is not true for m most of what we think that means. Um, an archer's small shield boss may have been made of steel, and likely was, because it was small, it was lightweight, and it could afford to be made of steel, what wouldn't create much wear and weight on the archer themselves, so that shield might be made of steel. A jousting tournament shield that is attached to the armor itself might be made of steel, but a battle shield, a shield that a knight is going to ride with, or a shield that an infantryman is going to wield, and that there need to be 15,000 of, those will not be made of steel or metal. Um, shields like that, that are made of metal, are largely ceremonial. Um, and I can explain why, from a functional sense, these shields, battle shields, weren't made of metal, largely. And it's for several key reasons. The first is steel manufacturing process back in those days wasn't as refined as it is now. A piece of sheet metal back then would weigh a lot more than it would today because the refinement process isn't able to pull enough of the impurities out of the metal. So the, he the metal's gonna be heavier to begin with. Making a piece of sheet metal that large, large enough for a shield, is a time and labor and money, you know, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so if you're a knight, sure. You can afford a steel shield if you want, but the fact that it's gonna be very heavy when you already have 80 pounds of kit is a detractor. If you're talking about trying to supply an army of 15,000 soldiers and you're the king and you're paying for their equipment, you probably, or the empire's paying for their equipment, you probably don't wanna spend the extra money to produce steel shields that are gonna take time, a lot more money, a lot more labor, and ultimately are going to be very heavy and much more and much harder for the infantrymen to use. And this all ties into the other major reason, or the other the other major uh, functional reason that shields weren't made of metal often. And that's because on the battlefield, your shield, after some period of time, is likely to get damaged or broken, even if it's steel. Now. You can have, if you're a knight, you can have four or five shields that you've already bought, already had produced. You can have them all ready, and when you break one, you have another. But again, that's more money, and then that's more weight for your caravan, your you know personal crew that you have as a knight. It's more for them to carry, more weight. So it makes a lot more sense for armies to produce cheap, mass, mass amounts of wooden shields that do fine, 
in battles and for campaigns. They may not last 30 years. They may only last one battle if it's a really, really hard battle. But that's okay because they're easy to reproduce and you can easily have, you know, 10 extra shields of those, whereas the same cost would only get you maybe a second steel shield. So shields were often meant to only last one campaign, one war season, and then if it got broken, oh well, you as a knight, you probably have four or five waiting for you back at your base camp after the battle. So those are all the reasons to, to explain why you're seeing me work with wood instead of metal. All right, now that's done. In the washer. On its highest heat setting. There we go. All right, so at this stage, the fabric has come out of the wash. Now, unfortunately for you, uh, details such as the difference in before and after are not something the camera is going to be able to capture. It's really something that the human eye has to see, but it is quite notable. Um, so if you're ever curious, you can just grab yourself a piece of 100% linen, throw it in the wash on its highest heat setting, and be amazed at the difference that comes out. Uh, next step. I need to iron the fabric to before I can do uh, start applying it, but I'm not going to show you that because whoop-de-doo, it's me ironing a piece of fabric. What I am going to show you is me, uh, before I iron it, I have to actually lay it out and get it cut to size and shape. That way I don't have to iron as much fabric. This is These are large pieces of fabric and they get unwieldy when they're that big. So that is what we are going to do right now. Um, so. I sadly don't have the best place to do this, or the best setup to do this stage, um, but we will make it work. Um, if I'm being, uh, to tell you a funny story actually, the fraternity house back when I was an active, we had a, um, an air hockey table down in one of the main rooms near my room, and it wasn't used very often. Uh, so what I would do is, whenever I was doing large stuff like this, especially with fabric, always with fabric, um, I would go and use the tabletop of the air hockey table exactly for things like this. Um, I sadly don't have an air hockey table, nor the space for an air hockey table here, but just a funny little memory from my time in the chapter. All right. This doesn't have to be super super precise make this go quicker and these are these are the steps that are mm, not back breaking but these are the steps that make you tired at the end of the day Ooh, I should make sure since I'm using a sharpie I should make sure that it's over the mat Otherwise, carpet. So I guess at this stage it makes sense for me to explain why is linen going on the shield? Or why is linen a part of the shield? And I can explain that by saying linen, or you know, sheets of canvas, were historically used uh, not just in medieval Europe, but in much of antiquity throughout the world, uh, as a form of soft armor, and in the case of shields, uh, coverings for the shield. So you make a shield out of wood, 
and then you glue down you, to the entire surface, you cover the entire surface of the wooden shield with glue, and then you lay down a layer of fabric, linen, canvas, covering the entire surface of it, pull it taut, pull it tight across the surface, let the glue dry, then you do another layer. And you maybe do another layer, you maybe do three, four layers, but in any, but what this does is it slowly builds up, you know, it's like the idea of cutting through a piece of paper. Sure, your scissors can easily cut through one piece of paper. Five pieces of paper, if you have dull scissors, eh, that might be getting tricky. 20 pieces of paper, that's really tricky. Um, and so that's the approach to what the, lay, the fabric covering shields was, was when you layer it up like that, it is very, very good at deflecting and dealing with um, damage coming from you know, whatever weapon may come its way. And there's also, for knights, linen was used in the same manner as the, basically the soft portion of the armor. Um, most people don't realize armor is layered. Uh, you have, you know, realistically, or I guess the simple way to say it is you have three layers of armor. Your light armor, your medium armor, and your heavy armor. Your light armor will be your gambeson, your brie, your hosen. It's all layered linen um, that's designed to act as a sort of padding, but it can actually um, prevent blades from going through it. Slicing through a gambeson, uh, especially a Viking gambeson, for instance, which may be 20 layers thick, it's incredibly difficult for a blade, even if the blade is razor sharp, and that's realistically the only way you have of, you know, best getting through it. Um, so light armor is very important, and even though it's just fabric, it's actually incredibly, incredibly effective. Medium armor, you know, may be chainmail. Uh, you can have, you know, depending on your time period, you can have chainmail that covers your entire body, or you can have chainmail that is attached to your light armor um, and covers just certain areas, the joints and the weak points. And then you have your heavy armor, which is your plate armor, which goes on the very top. Um, but Light armor, it, none of it works without light armor. Light armor is the absolute minimum, the very first step in all of this. And it's done with fabric like linen or canvas. I guess I will show you a quick time lapse of me cutting and ironing the fabric, although quick because I know this is not the most interesting step of this process. All right, Jeff, we are now out in my shop, and I'm finding a tool that I need for this. And what we are going to do is coat the shield in wood glue, the outer layer, the outer surface, the outer face. And then we are going to, hold on. So I've got to do that to break off the, the dried bit. Normally you don't need to do that with glue, but wood glue is one of those few types of glue that if it is applied properly, it really lives up to its name and never lets go. But what we are doing right now is going to just squeeze out a lot of glue. All over this thing, I'm gonna spread it out with my scraper. And then we will lay the fabric over it. So, there we go. All right. This glue doesn't dry super fast. It actually takes 24 hours to fully cure, but it starts to get tacky pretty quick. I mean, 
I certainly have enough time to do it right, but if I'm not careful, I'll lose the best period to do it. And yes, all this overlap will be dealt with. All right, here we go. And now, wood glue, you know, best if you're able to put it under a lot of tension and pressure, but for cases like this, it's not necessary. And it'll dry very, very strong, very well attached. Especially once I wrap the corners around. But all I'm concerned with right now is just getting it on there to be in. shortage of cylindrical shaped objects in my shop. makers in general is we make do and find solutions with what we have available. Oh yeah, look, that's actually making a real difference. I doubt the camera can capture it, honestly, at all, but from here it's actually making a serious, serious difference to the finish. this rolling process here real quick um, and then the next step because I have to do this a second time I've got another sheet that goes over this after I do the edges so I guess that'll be the next thing you get to see I'm gonna wrap the edges uh, so let's cut to that this stage I'm going to lay down a thin well three thin layers of gesso over the entire thing um, both layers of fabric are now on here let me before I start doing the gesso let me just get everything but it'll get the little bits All right, but this will prep it for painting. Ooh, nasty. Nasty and white. A very, very good excuse to wear my apron so I don't get my nice logo shirt dirty. I'm going to do this three times, very thin coats, and then see about getting some paint done. I got to give a shout out here 
thank y'all for actually having a full resources library on the website that has all the information about what colors I need to buy, color codes, the logos, like that is about to make this whole process much, much easier. At this stage, we are ready to begin painting uh, to make my life a little bit easier. I spent a few hours, slapped together a real basic anvil. And now that I have that and I can paint inside instead of out in the miserably hot shop, we are ready to begin. And this is all gonna be time lapse because this is gonna take me quite a while to do. All right, Jeff, it's taken me about a week, but your shield is finally painted. Oh, let's see. I painted this entire quadrant today. Started about 4 p.m. It's now 10 p.m. Took me six hours to paint that one quadrant. So, very excited to have this done. The final step in the painting process is I'm going to apply a coat of Mod Podge to the entire thing. Um, this is basically just a, it's a sealant and a protective barrier. Um, although this is latex paint that I've used, it's just nice to have a little extra protection, which is what this will do. Um, and it'll also help bring out the true intensity and the true depth of the color. Um, it's probably not something that you can see on camera. It's something more that you have to witness firsthand, but, um, the tones and the hues of all the colors will change ever so slightly, but perceptibly once this is on there, once it dries, uh, makes it pop, makes it a lot nicer. Um, so that's the final thing. And then tomorrow I get to start working on edging and strapping the shield. I got about a week and a half before I head up to St. Louis to present this to you, but those final two steps don't really take too long. So whew, we'll go ahead and get this done, let this dry overnight and when it, when comes the morning, I can get started on the next phases. So let's go ahead, do this. You know, probably. Whoop, get rid of the amount I just used on this brush, but I nope, can't use that brush. I was gonna say I was gonna transition to a bigger brush, but that brush is so big it won't fit inside this bottle, so 
We'll live with this brush. It won't be that bad. It'll just take me a second longer. It'll also be easier to clean. Whew. Now, my guess, I'm not exactly sure, but my guess would be for, I don't, I don't know what types of uh, sealants they used for paint in the Middle Ages, but I do know that beeswax was commonly used on armor as a way to help keep it from rusting and add a, a sealant barrier, a sealant layer. Um, that might have been, I'll have to double check that and to let you know later, but that might have been the method they used. Coat of beeswax over the entire thing just to help seal things in. But that would not help bring out the colors, although I have done that with some pieces of my armor. The only downside to doing that is that eventually the beeswax wears off, wears away. Um, you know, just bit by bit, slowly over time, heat helps it slowly, slowly melt and come off. It's imperceptible until one day you realize, wait a minute, there's no more wax on this thing. But for you, we will do the Mod Podge. And I know, it looks like, oh my lord, it's messing up the whole thing. It's creating that weird opaque layer. Don't worry, no matter how thick I layer this on there, it will dry smooth. It will fully dry and cure and be invisible. But I guess I can tell you, since I have you on a regular film right now, not time lapse, I'll tell you. Did take me about, oh, I guess a week in total to paint this one shield. Uh, within that time, I actually started to give myself tennis elbow from painting um, for too long a periods trying to get it done because I am on a tight schedule getting this thing ready for you. Um, started to give myself tennis elbow just because all these details are so fine and I have to be so accurate with small brushes that, you know, it takes me six hours to do one quadrant and if I try and do much more than one quadrant or if one quadrant is particularly detailed and difficult, then I start getting tennis elbow and I actually had to take a break for a few days in the midst of painting to, you know, taking anti-inflammatories and, you know, putting icy hot stuff on my elbow just so I could, you know, get back to a state where I could do it. So, whoo, just a little in-depth behind the scenes about just the level of work that goes into painting this because the time lapse, uh, let me see if I get this right. So the time lapse is already on camera. It's already set to 30 times normal speed. And then in post, when I edit it together, um, I'll probably take each of those clips, because each of those clips can be between one minute to three minutes. I'll take each of those clips and um, I'll probably speed that up even more, um, maybe to mm, 10 times that speed. So I guess that's what? 10 times 30, is that a factor of 300? 300 times, 300 times faster than it would, would be to the normal eye? Not sure if that math is 100% correct, but that's uh, whew, another little behind the scenes for you. And I will say, Unfortunately, to some degree, um, there will probably be little blemishes where there was a speck of color in the wrong spot that I didn't see, and I didn't see it because the Mod Pod wasn't on there. What was before dull and maybe hard for my eye to spot, looking at the whole thing, once the Mod Pod dries over it, will flare it up a little bit. So there'll probably be a speck or two here or there of the wrong color in the wrong spot, just because without the Mod Podge on there, I couldn't really see it. Ooh, my arm is tired. Luckily no tennis elbow right now, but I will pop an anti-inflammatory after this, but it is sore.
not helped by the fact that I did a bunch of contracting work and some landscaping work today to whew, get a little extra money, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Alright, I guess at this stage, since there's probably no other really behind the scenes stuff for you to hear, um, I will go ahead and send it to time lapse so that this can be done and we can get on to the next stage. Alright, Jeff. We are in the very final stages of finishing your shield. Right now I'm marking the edge um, for where, well I'm marking the, um, the cut in for where the edging is going to go. The edging lays on the, covers the edge and overlaps a little bit on front and back. So I have to mark in for how much it's going to do that. Excuse me. The edging itself has a, um, it's moist and it's wet. That's how it, uh, it, it's soft when it's wet. It's malleable and soft when it's wet. When it becomes dry, it becomes very, very rigid, very sturdy, very strong. Um, but the water uh, mixed with kind of some of the chemicals that the edging is made of, um, if it gets on the shield, it tends to discolor it slightly in spots, and we don't want that. So, we are going to prevent it by marking this area off, and then taping everything inside this area, covering it with tape, so that it is shielded, pun intended, um, and then we can start marking holes. I know, for you, you can't see any of this. This is, I can barely see it. I can see it enough to work with it, but not really enough to do anything else. Certainly not to show you. But Jeff, we are only counting this night that I'm going to work on it. We're really only a day and a half away from this shield being finished and ready for you. Then after that I get to work on the video. Take me another few days. It is now, it is Tuesday. Still got, I leave next Wednesday Next Wednesday is the 15th, and that's when I head up to St. Louis, so a little over a week to get everything done, but looks like we're going to make it. Tape, tape. I know it looks like I just got so much junk lying around. It's not really, but actually, I'm going to use, well, actually, this whole pile of junk is all the stuff that I need to finish your shield. Kind of keeping it close, which I don't, uh, don't have to go searching for it again amongst all my other stuff. Get a few things out of there. All right. Tape, 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 tape. Tape, 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 tape.
All right, now I can mark the holes. Or I can, yeah, I can mark for where I need to drill the holes for the edging. And this is the stage of, or this is the type of stage for any maker um, that is miserable because I have to start damaging my finished piece. Okay. Mark on it and drill holes in it, and for pretty much any maker, this type of stage is always the worst. And the only way to deal with it is just to bite the bullet and start doing it. It's like jumping into a cold pool. Just go ahead and do it, it's easier. to the drilling stage. So I'm now going to drill every single one of those holes I just made. Shouldn't take me too long, but it will be hot and sweaty. Now, I can do the edge. All right. Now, it is the second to last stage, the edging stage, which includes animal hide. Yes, it includes animal hide. So, this is raw hide, and I know what you're thinking, the, like the dog toy? Yes, exactly like the dog toy. Um, and that is why, as a tip that you should burn into your brain this minute, never forget it, always be thinking about it, never leave the shield anywhere a dog can get it, because though it doesn't look like a rawhide bone, dogs still identify it as the same thing, because they're smart, and they'll chew it up. So, don't leave this, don't leave your finished shield on the ground or anywhere a dog can get to it, because they will realize what this is. But the reason we use this, and this is historically what was used, um, rawhide, as you can plainly see right now, when it's soaking wet, rawhide is extremely malleable and pliant, and you know you can puncture through it, and you can move it and mold it and do all this stuff, but when it dries, as you know from a rawhide dog toy, it is incredibly, incredibly tough, scratch and abrasive resistant, and that is exactly why it is used for the edges of shields. Um, the edges of shields are the most fragile, the most brittle, the part that can be broken the easiest um, from any sort of um, weapon hitting it. So, if you cover the edge of the shield in rawhide, you successfully prevent it from with, uh, taking damage. It can still get slowly damaged over time, but the shield overall will keep uh, much, much, much longer. Um, and this is how they did it in medieval times. There are several methods, several ways to, um, specifically to uh, edge the shield. Um, you can glue the rawhide on. I personally do um, this threaded system that I like to do um, because it, it's a little, I have a little, it's a little more work, but I feel like it adds a nice aesthetic. Um, the thread around the edge, and as well, um, it really holds everything exactly in place where I want it to be during this process. So, I use needle, and it's hidden over here from view. I use needle and 
waxed thread. This is a thick gauge waxed thread, which is what they would have used in medieval times. I told you earlier, wax was very useful for a lot of reasons. This is one of them. Now, this thread is pretty weather resistant and pretty durable because it is wax. Um, I gotta roll out a big amount here, unwind a large amount here. But this process takes eh, a few hours. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to make myself suffer in some heat. I'm gonna turn off the air, con the fan up here because it will dry out the rawhide faster, making it harder for me to work. Um, I'd rather be a little hot than have to deal with that. All right, this should hopefully be enough string. Probably not, but I can always attach a new piece. That's not a trick. All right, so we have that. We have our needle. And this is a delicate process. Uh, you have to be careful because the rawhide, even though it's weaker right now, it's still very durable. And if you're not careful, you can break a needle and poke and uh, puncture yourself pretty badly with a broken needle uh, tip, which I have done before. But I'm going to start this process, uh, but I won't make you watch the whole, well, I'll time lapse the rest of it. I'll get started and then we'll time lapse. Oh, oh, hold on. I want my guard. I would prefer not to get as much of the juice on me as possible. Um, so I have this little thing to cover my lap here. And start at the bottom of the shield. Doo -doo -doo. All right. Oh, this is not an exhilarating process. It is quite a laborious one, but it's really satisfying when you do it right. And see, my dog is sniffing around because he smells it. He knows what this is, and we don't even get him rawhide toys anymore. But he is very well aware of what this is, despite it not being the same, same shape. And it is true, once you, uh, once this stuff hardens, the thread really does become more or less just ornamental. But, it looks good. Let's see, I'll get a few loops done for you. Then I'll, uh, time lapse the rest. <laughs> Yeah. And the hard part really is the first pass. First pass where there's no holes and it's not lined up, it's not attached yet. Um, and I'll show you what, when I, when I say first pass, I mean I don't f do a full loop of attachments on the first run. Um, it takes too much time, it's too diff, it's honestly, it complicates things, makes things a little bit harder. So what I do is I uh, switch, I go back and forth, side to side. I go in one side out the other side and instead of looping back I just go on to the next hole and so it's uh, it's alternating but then once I get to the end I come back and do decide the part that I've missed and I'll be able to demonstrate that here in a second midnight away not for you Good boy. I wonder he hasn't found my shield in the other room and messed with it. Now I say that, he's going to go find it. All right. It does have a weird smell to it. And it's slippery, it makes the needle slippery. Got to use pliers to help pull it through all the way. Because this thread is so thick, it does actually... Um, stops it up. It makes it difficult for it to run through these holes. Even though the holes are plenty big, the uh, added mass or the added diameter of a doubled up string and of the um, the actual hide getting in the way as it goes through the hole complicates it. the thimble. Save the skin on my fingertips. 
no bleeding. Unfortunately, injuries happen when you do my this sort of stuff. It's just a part of the job. All right. So I think there you can see what I'm talking about. There's a piece of thread, there's a gap, thread, gap, thread, gap, thread, gap, and on the other side it's the reverse. There's a thread here, there's a gap there, and so that's what I mean by alternating. And so when I get to the end of this strip, down there, I will reverse and come back and do the other side. Fill in the gaps. So it'll be a full loop. And that's just, in my experience, works a lot better than doing it, all, wrapping them all at once. All right, Jeff, the edge is done. Looks pretty good. Back side is a little curling, but that's fine. Front side is good. All right, so now that this is done, all I have left to do is put in the straps, and I've got all my leather already cut to size. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put together the, um, really there's only one thing I have to put together, and then everything else I just stain it black and attach it. So let's go out to the shop. I'll put together the one piece that I have to, and then we can stain everything, attach everything, and then we should be wrapped up. So out to the All right, Jeff, so the ver the really the only thing I need to do out in this shop is make a set of four rivets, and I'll tell you why. I'll show you why. The main strap, or the largest strap for the shield, has uh, two components, or technically three. But at the ends of the straps, I have to bind them together through these holes that I've punched. That way, when I attach it to the shield, it can attach like this against the shield, against the flat face of the shield, and it'll be held together. It's much stronger this way. I have to bind those two pieces of leather together, though, and to do that, I need to make some rivets. And to make rivets, medieval-style rivets, I have a nail, just a basic steel nail that you get at any home improvement store. Good, nice, and thick. I think this one's what a... Probably a 10D, 8D, no, 12D, look at that, 12D nail, that's the size of it. And anyway, I wish the camera could show you exactly what I'm going to do, but basically what I'm going to do is mushroom the tip of this. Let's see, I might have another rivet over here that I can show you. I don't know if the camera can capture it because this is truly a, this is very small detail, but this nail gets turned, oh yeah, you can see it pretty well, into that this little mushroom piece of steel that I then clip off. I know that seems so easy, and I thought that too when I first started making them long ago, but it is something that takes quite a bit of practice to get right, and patience. But that is what I'm gonna do now. I'm glad I could show you a finished versus an uh, original one because it is unlikely you'll be able to see much of anything as it actually moves, but I'll try and get the best shot possible for you. Let's see if you actually can see the change. Never tried to record something this small. But here we go.
Simple as that. Extend you back out. Simple as that. I now have whoop, four rivets. Ready to bind those pieces together, and then we can go inside and get these things dyed and attached. Grab the hammer. Actually, use my anvil for this. So we have one washer, goes on the rivet first, put the rivet through one hole, put the rivet through the other hole. Ooh, rivet's a little short. That's surprising, honestly. There we go, now yeah, that's better. Put on the second washer, turn on my music to protect my hearing. Just like that, one rivet attached. And that's more or less, it's not a perfect rivet, but it's pretty good. All right, now I'll time lapse look the next three and we can head inside. I was done when I put the straps on, but that was a bit of a lie. Because for anything I make for a brother, I always do an extra step where I sign it with my Zeta number. By sign it, I mean burn it in with a wood burn. So that is the very, very final step. Let me get my wood burner out here and once this thing is signed, I can remove I can remove the tape and she's ready for battle.
now that all that's done, all that's left is to remove the tape. thing for me to explain in the nerdiness of this longer video is how the strap system works for the shield. This is actually accurate to how some shields are strapped um, during the middle medieval period. Um, there are a few different functions this ha these straps have. One, you can see the main strap system that I'm using uh, that's supporting the shield. Um, you'll notice that it's at an angle. It's not going horizontal across the shield. It's actually angled up. That's because it's actually very difficult to hold a shield up if you have it horizontally. If you have it angled, it makes it much easier for you to hold up. Um, the other strap that we see, or one of the others, is obviously the long strap. It can be used to do things like this, or do things like this to carry the shield, or in addition, it can be used to do things like this, which helps you actually support the shield, takes some of the weight off your bot, off your arm, lets your shoulders and your upper body take some of the support. This is for, this could have been and was sometimes used in fighting. So that's another way that we see this being used. It can be used in the same way in the other orientation, which is this way. This is, again, another way to hold the shield. This one extends the range of the arm, pushes the shield further out, and actually helps push the shield's, well, shielding abilities further away from you, further out. It does limit your movements a little bit more. If you take off the shoulder strap, it, it you know, gives you some of the back, but it does kind of lock your arm in place. But this is another method, technique, of uh, holding the shield. So, all that said and done, that's pretty much it for the final exposition. Again, I want to say thank you for your years of service. Um, I'm glad I got to, this was such an honor for me. Very thankful I got to do this for you. Uh, big thanks to Dan for getting this put together and orchestrating this. And I hope you enjoy your battle grade shield for many years to come.